Hey everyone, thanks for coming and joining me again. I'm Matthew Nagy and this is the Modern Maker Workroom. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about what's going on, what the next bit is, and you know, the, the thing that's really important for me to talk about right now is planning. It, I have so many videos about sewing, about actually making the projects, and I can definitely tell you step by step how to actually sew something. But in the grand scheme of making a historical garment or historical look impression, you're really not going to have the sewing as the main idea center stage, right? Like in the grand scheme of things, does it really even matter if you hand sew the garment or machine sew it? If your pattern is incorrect, your silhouette's going to be wrong. Uh, if the proportions are off, then the eye is going to know it and it's just going to look like a bad costume. There's so many little details that you need to focus on before you even worry about the sewing. Like, the only thing you're really going to notice is hand finishing and whether you've got hand sewn buttonholes or not. And I think because of that, I've, I, uh, I need to really talk about planning and thinking about the project. I, I tell you how to position your hands. I tell you how to position your body when you're sewing, but I don't really tell you how to position your mind. And I think that's the most important thing here. It, yes, I do tell you a little bit about how to position your mind when you're actually sewing in terms of think in, in this rhythm or, you know, picture a skilled craftsman doing the work so that you can emulate their movements. There's a lot of little things, little tips and tricks for the actual sewing process that I can teach. And I think that's great. But if I haven't taught you project planning, if I haven't talked to you about starting at the beginning, figuring out what the end needs to be and making milestones and, and goalposts along the way, then you're never going to reach the end in anything that resembles a comfortable, enjoyable process, right? Like, in the end, this is all about having a good time. We're exploring history because we want to see ourselves in it. We want to feel ourselves in it. And if we're feeling ourselves in it in a state of stress and anxiety because we haven't planned our project properly, because we haven't thought around the next couple of corners in terms of technique, in terms of... of you know, accuracy, then we're wasting our time. And I know so many people, and it breaks my heart, but I know so many people who put all this work and effort into a project and they're doing it completely by hand. And then by the time they reach the end of it, they don't like the project anymore. It doesn't fit the way they want it to. And they're just sad and disappointed. And all of this effort, these hours of their lives that are spent creating this project, then become hours of their lives that are spent in creating a moment for them to be sad. Now, all of the advice that I could give about spirituality and finding a center in yourself and not letting those things bother you, I could go on about that forever and ever. There's plenty of YouTube channels that do, but in the end, what we need to do is we need to create a process that makes things predictable, that sets us up to think through everything so that by the time we reach the end, we're reaching the end and there aren't any surprises and we've had a nice smooth journey from beginning to end. And then we enjoy it and we put the garment on and it feels so good and it fits so well and we look like we've stepped out of a painting and suddenly you've created a moment of joy for yourself. And if anybody that you have talked to along the way has learned something, then me helping you helping them has made the world a better place. And that's really what this is all about. As much as we want to talk about it's for my own personal enjoyment, well, if I'm enjoying it and I become a happier person because I'm enjoying it, then that makes my little sphere a better place. And I think that's super important because otherwise, why are we doing it? Why are we spending all of this time laboriously hand sewing something and figuring out all the fine details if in the end, it's not going to make us feel amazing. Like, why are we going to do it if it's not going to make us feel 10 feet tall? It's not going to make us feel like we own the world. Even for just a few minutes, that endorphin rush, that hit is fantastic. And we want to make sure that we get that in a way that is high quality and long lasting. 
instead of a momentary blitz and then it's done. So because of that, let's talk about the planning. So the first step is really just talking about analyzing an image or analyzing an extant garment to make some choices. And I would write these down, right? So if you've been following along, you know that I'm working on a reproduction of the suit that's in Gian Battista Moroni's Portrait of the Tailor. Now, I have made this suit many, many times, but every iteration I do, I learn something new. In this particular iteration, my goal is to create something that looks just like the portrait, that has the exact same feel as the portrait, the colors, the balance, the proportion, everything should feel correct. And one of the problems that we run into is that we look at a painting and the details that stand out to us stand out to us. And the problem with them standing out to us so loudly is that in the time period, they may have been completely normal and nobody would have noticed them as much as we do, but because they're unique in our existence, they're unique to our point of view, then we see them and that we kind of perceive them as bigger, which means then we end up making them bigger. Take, for example, the ruffles on the tailor's shirt that are sticking out from around his doublet, right? Like, I know people that make ruffles like this and they make these ruffles like an inch long. I've made them an inch long, 2.5 centimeters, sometimes three centimeters, and they're just too big. It's a very, very Rococo 18th century proportion of a wrist ruffle, whereas his, if we really look at them, they're maybe half an inch wide, 1.2 centimeters, that's it. And then they're really heavily gathered, so they create the perfect figure of eight, probably without a whole lot of pressing and fussing. And he's got them at the neck, and he's got them at the wrist, and they're about the same size. When I compare the size and frequency of the figure eight in the little ruffle around the wrist, and I compare that to the size of his fingers, or one of my favorite things is compare it to the size of his eye, because the human eye is almost universally about, about three centimeters or 1.5 inches wide. And because of that, we can use the eyes that are painted in a portrait as a scale for us to measure against so that we can really get a feel for the size of the objects that he's wearing. But right now, since the ruffle is closer to his hand than it is to his eye, I'm looking at it, and you can see me looking over the wall because the painting is right behind the camera. But, uh, you know, I, I can see that these ruffles are about half an inch in depth, and then in height, they're maybe one centimeter. They're maybe three-eighths of an inch in the height in the figure eight, so they're quite small, which means the hem is really tiny, which means they're gathered really firmly, and I, I just... I can't wait to make this shirt because I think it's going to sit so beautifully on the body. Now, the cuff itself, I would wager is probably, I don't know, an inch and a half wide, maybe three centimeters wide. And then you have the shirt going up underneath it, which probably has a sleeve that isn't particularly full just because of the closeness of the fit of the sleeves on his doublet. So that detail alone leads me to think, okay, the ruffles are quite small. But then I compare the size of the ruffles to the size of the picadills at his wrist, and I can see, okay, these picadills are probably about three-eighths of an inch to half an inch wide. So one to 1.2 centimeters wide, and there's a double layer of them. Cool. I'll make sure to include that in my next iteration of the doublet. The one that I just finished for the Piscot Belly video, I was really focusing on the interior structure and the lightness and the padding, so I kind of left these picadill strips out but I have a new piece of taffeta that is just the right shade of creamy beige. I think it's gonna be perfect, and it's gonna contrast beautifully against the white of the linen shirt and the red of the trunk hose. So I will do another version of it soon, and maybe I'll update the doublet videos in the process. Not sure yet. I've just finished the Peace God video, so I'm not really there. I'll move forward to discussing the breeches now because I've gotten the ruffle and my idea of what the ruffle is. The shirt itself is probably the same as most other shirts in the time period. Since I can't see it, I'm just going to make an educated guess based on extant pieces that are from the same time period or close to the same time period. This suit is about 1570. I think a lot of the shirts that we have for men are probably well into the 1700s or the 1580s. So they're a little bit later, but we can still use them as a gauge for what we should be making. Now, going by the proportion thing and the scale thing, if I think that the uh, clips on his picadills are about three eighths of an inch wide, and then I compare those picadills to the width of the panes on his trunk hose, I can see that the trunk hose also are only about three, three and a half centimeters wide for each pane. 
that's really narrow and that's much narrower than most people make them. A lot of people make their panes a minimum of two inches wide. And that means that again, you have this scale that is overblown, this scale that is oversized, that just kind of makes everything look and feel a little bit like a cartoon. It's caricaturized because you're exaggerating the proportions of things. Similarly with the con piece, the con piece in this painting is very small and almost invisible. And I don't want to really draw attention to it because frankly, I'm embarrassed by con pieces. I'm a modern man. I think they're weird. I try not to wear them, honestly. For this suit, however, I'll make one because that makes it correct. But moving on with the analysis of the trunk hose, I can see that there is a greenish brown colored silk inside for the, the poof of the trunk hose. That's great. Uh, I'll show you some fabrics in a minute. I have just the right fabrics to make this. Oh, the red is a little bit too much toward the blue for my taste, but it's really hard to find an orange based red in these kinds of fabrics right now. Most everything is a very blue based red. So moving on, I can look at the waist. I can see the gathers descending from the waistband of the breeches, and I can see that they are, you know, the fullness is probably 2.5 times fullness. I think if it were three times fullness, these gathers would be a little deeper, though they do look pretty thick. So if you're looking at two, maybe three gathers per pane, right, and they're this thick looking, that means that it's probably a double layered paint. So what's probably happening with the paint, and I'm going to do a little sample here so that you can see, but what's probably happening with the paint is that it's cut uh, quite a bit wider. It's probably cut about five centimeters wide, maybe even, maybe even as many as seven or eight centimeters wide. And for those of you who don't use metric, that's probably close to like you know, getting up into three inches wide, two and a half, two and three quarter inches wide. And then the edges are folded back and they're hemmed down on the backside. And there is likely another strip of wool behind them that is hemmed down to cover the raw edges. And then once that's done, the edges then have these little pinks along them, these little cuts and the cuts are placed at an angle. And from the way the painting looks, it appears as though one pane, the cuts are angling up and then the next pane, the cuts are angling down. Uh, I, I'm going to see if I can find a higher resolution version of this so that I can corroborate that, but that's what it looks like to me just looking at this bad reproduction that's hanging on my wall. Going a little bit further with the trunk hose also, this is a big thing that I can see. He's got a hip roll on. When you compare the size of his waist to the fullness of the breeches, to the roundness of the top of the breeches, I can probably draw for you the exact size and proportion of the hip roll that he's wearing underneath this. I would say that it's probably about, I would say it's probably about mm, three inches in diameter. So three inches in diameter, 3.141, you're looking at like nine and a half to nine and three quarter inches in circumference. That's a pretty big hip roll. Now you put the weight of trunk hose on top of that, it's going to drape a little bit lower. And I think that's good because I don't really think it needs to be too boofy, but he's got some good support in there. Now, I'm quite a bit bigger than he is. He looks like a fairly thin man to me in this painting, and I'm definitely not that. So I might have to balance the proportion based on my own body, but I don't want to overdo it, and I want to make sure that I keep something that's sort of stylistically representative of the time period. And that may not mean inflating the proportions of the hip roll just so that I look the same size as him because I'm not and I'm okay not being the same size as him. I'm me. So if I were having this suit made for me, what choices would I make while still maintaining the correct dressing styling of the period, which is a hip roll. Now, I don't think uh, there's much in the way of stuffing in the lower part of these. I think a lot of the bottom curve that you're seeing in these breeches and these in these trunk hose has to do with gravity pulling down and the fact that the lining is cut to a different shape than the exterior, which brings up the bottom and creates that sort of cupped under bulge, for lack of a better terminology. I don't think that these breeches have canyons. It's really not something that you see as often in the 70s, especially in Italy. Most often you would see a silk stocking or a wool stocking that is sewn to the bottom of the trunk hose opening. So the whole thing is just like a pair of tights with a boof on top and you've got the, the stocking coming up and it's just sewn into the leg opening around the thigh. 
And I feel like that's probably what I'm seeing here. I wouldn't think that there's canyons on it. If there were, it would make my job a lot easier, but no, I'm probably gonna have to knit a pair of stockings that are extra long, specifically so that I can sew them onto the bottom of the trunk hose. So inside the trunk hose, let's think about this. There, I, I can conceive that there are three major layers with what's going on here. There's the exterior layer, that's the red wool. I definitely believe that this is wool. And then there's the silk layer on the inside. You can see that it's shiny already. It's probably, it's probably a, a satin, I would think, although the fabric that I have is a taffeta. Uh, and it may actually be a, a really smooth shantung. It's kind of hard to tell sometimes. Uh, it's not as dense as a true taffeta weave. Um, so I might be calling it a shantung or maybe a silk sheeting since there's really not much in the way of slubs in it. I like the shape and curve of the belt. I like all of the things about this suit, but I really feel like the trunk hose, I'm gonna need a hip roll. I'm gonna keep them quite light because again, I'm still going for the summer wear. I think the cod piece has a little slash in the side, although I don't know that there's anything poofing out. It might have some silk inside it that flashes through the cut, but uh, it definitely looks like there's a shadow on the cod piece that could be a pink. With that being said, I would say that the waistband is probably quite narrow, given that the skirting on his doublet is quite narrow. So the waistband of the breeches is going to be maybe three quarters of an inch, half an inch to three quarters of an inch. There are some surviving examples where the waistband of the breeches is basically just a binding. There's not even a lacing strip made into it because, and this is a fun reality, a fun fact that I'm gonna show you a little bit of, sometimes, and this is very specific to the German examples that we have, which are the only examples we have that have, have a hip roll with them. The hip roll is attached to the doublet, which blew my mind when I first saw that. I, I had no idea, it would never even occur to me that it goes on the doublet. And the, the extant examples we have, it's literally, it's sewn to the bottom of the lacing strip. So the lacing strip is there with its eyelet holes in it, but then there's this, this this roll of stuffed fabric that is literally just whip stitched around to the bottom of the, the lacing strip. It's fascinating. So if you have that, and then you have the waistband of the breeches, you don't even need eyelets in the waistband of the breeches. It just comes up over the hip roll, you fasten it closed, and then the size of the hip roll locks it in place, and you're never gonna worry about your clothes coming apart. And I like to talk about the reality of wearing these clothes. Guess what? that makes it a thousand times easier to use the bathroom. Oh my gosh, how many times have I talked about like, oh, you tie them together and you wear it like a jumpsuit and then you just take the whole thing off and run to the loo in your undershirt and, and under britches or maybe you throw on a, a dressing gown. Uh, that seems so illogical and yet it seems to be the way that I've assumed that it's done. But this, this new discovery that was made by my student in, in Germany, Yannick Prusa, hello, uh, just a shout out to him, fantastic research that he's doing with the team at Hanover. The, the breeches that go with these have nothing but a binding for the top of them. You don't even need to tie them to the doublet. It just goes up over the roll, fastens closed, and boop, it's locked in place. You're good to go. But then if you need to use the restroom, you just unfasten your trousers like a normal modern human being and do the thing that you need to do. I'm not gonna get too further into it because wow, it's just too much. Anyway, these breeches are fabulous. They are the next project for the Modern Maker workroom. So I wanna talk a little bit now about the fabric and the textiles. But before I do, one of the things you'll see at the end of this video is the pattern being drafted. Now I did a screen record of the pattern being drafted in Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator. Pattern making with Adobe Illustrator is coming up very soon. It's throughout the month of October. It's all the Saturdays in October, Sundays if you're in uh, Australia or New Zealand or Tasmania. Uh, and I'm gonna be taking you through the basics. You get a perfect bird's eye view of the pattern as you're making it. So it's much easier to spot flaws in the work or to compare the shapes to something from an extant book. And then also I find it's very fast to alter the pattern for other people because you just do a, a specific kind of grab technique and then you can lengthen, you can widen, you can enlarge, you can do all of these different techniques to make it bigger, better, easier to use or whatever 
size you need. Come join me for that. I think you'll really enjoy it, especially if you are a content creator and you want to create patterns that you can sell as PDF downloads. It's very important that you understand how to use Adobe Illustrator to get through all the different steps for that. I'll show you how to notate. I'll show you how to make dotted lines. I'll show you how to grade a pattern through a massive number of sizes with just a few clicks of your mouse. And that is a key ingredient to doing accurate patterns that people are really going to be able to use. And then I'll show you how to create your print templates with your branding on them and your logos. So please come join me for pattern making with Adobe Illustrator and the Modern Maker. So I've gone through my idea, which I call painting with a fine tip brush. Uh, I did a blog post on that. Um, a number of years ago, I think it was 2019 that I did that blog post. Find the link in the description down below. I really talked about this idea of tuning your eye to look at the small details. I think it's so important. Um, so in that vein, I have found uh, another taffeta. I really like this taffeta. It is, it's a nice creamy color. It has just the tiniest bit of, of of a, a tint to it. It doesn't really show up so well in the camera, but the doublet in the painting has a color. It's not just white. And I think most people that I see reproduce this just use straight white, but really it has a color because when you look at the whiteness of the shirt next to it, there's a creaminess to the silk of the doublet. And I do believe that it's made of silk because where the pinks are and the way it's painted on the left side of the wearer, you can actually see the slightly seersucker effect that happens when the, the pink is so precisely on grain that the weft threads are chopped, but the warp threads are not. And then the weft threads fray out and that leaves kind of like an extended loop, almost like a seersucker effect in the warp threads. And you can see that in the way that it's painted. So I definitely believe that this doublet is made of silk. I do not believe that it's made of suede or any material like that. I think the way that it's painted is so clear. I have this to do my next iteration, but since I've already done the piece cod doublet video, I don't really want to get too deep into that because I could get lost in the weeds on doing another rendition of that. But then I happen to have this red wool. Now this red wool, especially when I compare it to the color of the taffeta, we have such a good match in terms of value, in terms of intensity. I really like this red. Again, this red is a little bit too blue based. It's, it's got a bit of a cool color base to it, so it's not as yellow, uh, kind of that orangey red that the, the breeches are in the painting, but it's a good wool, it's the right weight. I think I'm gonna have a great time using it. And the techniques for making these are so easy. I think you're gonna really enjoy it. So then the silk that goes between the panes, right? Uh, this is an almost identical match to the version of the painting that I have in front of me. And this, again, this, this variation feels really good. Red and greens were put together all the time in these time periods. And I don't wanna shy away from that. I don't think it looks particularly Christmassy, especially when it's this sort of olivey, greenish, brownish, goldish, whatever. I mean, it's impossible to even really describe what shade that is, except maybe kind of, I don't know, uh, a, a dark goose turd green, maybe. <laughs> uh, so now I have my fabric. I know that the, the things are coming to make the belt. I've already made the doublet a couple of times. I'm going to do it again because I like to iterate. I like to solve all the problems and then feel confident that I really have the right garment the way that it was intended to be worn. So what I'll do is I'll show you here. This is also not a paid promotion. This is just a product that I love. This is Asana from asana.com. Now I have this set up as the sort of the, the, the board version. So it's, it's like things that are stuck up on a cork board and it really serves that function. There's different buckets that you can put things into, whether it's working on the cutting portion of it, whether it's part of the planning and logistics, whether it's fitting, whether it's shooting video of it, all of those elements are going to be here that, because I can make them, I can create whatever planning buckets that I need to. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll have a look at how long I want this video series to take to shoot, which is not very long. I like to shoot uh, one sewing video about every two weeks and then intersperse 
the sewing videos with talking head videos, much like this one. So Asana is something that I like to use to do all of this planning. And I begin with each piece and then I will fan each piece out into the different elements of each piece. And then I will start working through in my brain because I've been doing this for a while and I'll start thinking about how long does this part take me? How long is this aspect gonna take me? How much time am I allotting for a mistake to happen or the need to do a recut even? You have to plan for the bad things that happen. I think optimistic timeline planning is what gets people into trouble. So I always leave room for things to go wrong. Leaving room for anything to happen is really important and you have to understand yourself. That's part of where, that's part of where the, the personal growth side of being a maker really takes effect, right? You have to know yourself to understand where you're going to make a mistake. You have to look at your skill level in the face squarely and say, I'm not so good at that thing. It's going to take me longer to do that step, right? And for a lot of people, that's buttonholes. I know buttonholes have been the thing in my life that is the biggest pain in the butt. So when I first started doing them, even like a three quarter inch long, a, a two centimeter buttonhole would take me 45 minutes to stitch. Now I can do a buttonhole that size in about six to seven minutes. How many hundreds and hundreds of them have I had to do to get there? Be honest with yourself about how skilled you are so that you can plan for the areas where it's gonna be slower and you can create the timeline according to that. So within Asana, when you click on one of your little cards, it opens up and you can set a date for completion. You can set uh, a kind of how far along you are with the completion. You can leave yourself notes. You can create a description and you can even assign. So if you're working with a team, which some people are, especially if you're making something for an event for a specific person and you have a lot of people working together, in the same vein, if you're a small business owner and you are starting to grow your, your custom clothing business and there's two or three of you working together in a shop, you can plan that time, you can assign the different tasks, it's all there, and you can include other people on your calendar so that it's easy for them to get the information and you just have one home base where you all work together. I used it when I worked in a factory. I used it for planning my time when I worked in film and television. I have used it many times for planning my workflow for the modern maker, especially back in 2019 when I had an assistant. Caitlin, shout out to you, miss you like crazy. She and I would work together within our content flow from, uh, I think it was a different platform than Asana, but very same concept. So I, really want to encourage you to take advantage of these online platforms. They're not always free. There's usually a free version of them that doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but uh, whatever you do, try using a productivity app. Well, I have an Asana specifically created, a, a board created for this trunk hose series. I don't know how many parts it's going to be. There's a lot of fiddly work, but a lot of it's very repetitive. I think I can probably do the whole thing in two videos. While I'm talking about all of this content creation, I want to talk about why I'm so inspired to do this now. So the, so the, the technical side of it, of this video is done. So if that's all you were here for, have a wonderful evening. It's been wonderful having you here watching me. But now I'm going to talk about where I am in terms of the rebirth of the modern maker and why I'm so passionate right now. I was watching a YouTube video by uh, a young man named Dan Ko. I mean, he's, he's 26 years old. He's very young. His audience is much younger than I am. In fact, he, he regularly markets to 20 somethings and early 30 somethings. So I'm so far out of his demographic. And yet the things that he talks about, uh, the way that he combines uh, the, the sort of spirituality of his practice, his physical and mental health, and then his creative endeavors, the way he combines that really resonates with me because the modern maker is not just me making stuff. It's not just me writing books. It is me making stuff and me writing books. It is me learning things and then, then compartmentalizing them and then writing about them so that you all can learn from those experiences too. Somewhere in that, I also have to take care of my personal physical health, my mental health, my well-being. You know, I'm, I'm 
a little bit heavier than I want to be. So I have to, you know, start thinking about diet and exercise and all of those things. So just know that behind all of these videos that talk about making stuff, there's also a whole lifestyle going on. And I don't want it to ever seem like it's all just sunshine and roses and easy because it's not. This new process that I'm in is magnificent. And it's something that Dan talks about in his videos. And, and it really is that everything comes from the writing. And I've really come to realize that no matter how I slice it, I am a writer. First and foremost, that's how you get the information. That's how the books are published. That's, that's how people get that information. Uh, all the things that I send out online, that's how you all, everybody's reading it. So writing is the consumable content here. So every morning when I wake up for at least an hour, sometimes two, with my morning decaf, sometimes with a touch of caffeine in it, because sometimes I need the extra kick, uh, I'll sit here and I will just, whatever research thing is on my mind that I'm excited about, I will just brain dump into the computer. And that usually goes on, I don't know, probably for an hour, hour and a half. And I, I can usually wrap up my thoughts very, very easily. I type pretty quickly. So that makes it great. That makes it fun for me because it's not too much of a drag. But then immediately I will look at that and I'll start planning a newsletter from it. And then that newsletter fuels the next video. So those of you who are on my Patreon, you've already seen the foundation newsletter for what this video, uh, this video is. This video is all about the prep work. And then the video is gonna, then, then I'm gonna show you about drafting the pattern too. Those of you who are on my Patreon uh, also have received the newsletter already because you get first dibs at the newsletter. So you've already read it. That was uh, sent out to you this morning. Uh, most of the rest of the world isn't gonna see that newsletter until this Friday. And then this video is coming out the following Sunday. So that newsletter then fuels the video. The video then is all about the project. And then the project, as I work on it, gets shot in video and then also photographed. Those photographs then go into the book and then the book becomes more writing and then the newsletter is fueling the book. So all of this goes together and then you have new viewers coming in that haven't seen these things and then they see the content and then they say, oh, there's a book, oh, there's a newsletter and suddenly everything comes together. And that's what this new rebirth of The Modern Maker is all about. It used to be that I would try to manage everything as separate entities. The website was its own world. The Patreon was a different world. The, the YouTube channel was another world. The Instagram was another world. And then my Facebook page, both personal and professional, were another world as well. Sure, they had cross-posting, but there really wasn't a unified idea where it all kind of comes from one place. And that's what's really changed. And I think that's what's gonna make all of this work so much easier for me. Am I gonna stop talking about 16th and 17th century Spanish dress? Probably not. It's literally in my blood. I'm never gonna be able to let go of that. So if that's what you're here for, trust me, there will always be some connection to it in one way or another. Am I gonna stop talking about the Barra system? Absolutely not. It is one of the best ways to relay patterns to people of varying sizes to get them over the hump of pattern making so they can just get on with making the stuff. All of that together becomes one really interesting, complex business organism. And I'm so excited to be passionate about it again. It was really dark for me when I wasn't in this kind of place. And those, those of you who know me and have been following me for years, you know that I'm always passionate about what I do. So you can imagine how disconnected I felt from myself when that passion just kind of fizzled away. I spent a lot of my energy on other things, on other people, and not on nurturing my passions, which is what makes me feel whole. Nurturing those passions makes me feel like I'm alive. So I wasn't feeling alive, and that was really, really hard. So enough of that. Yes, there's emotions involved, and I, if I talk about it too much longer, I'm going to start to cry, and I don't want to do that in front of the camera. Just understand that this iteration feels so good, it feels right, and I really hope that you enjoy coming along with me on this journey. I'll get better at this as it goes, right? This is one of the first videos I've done on this style. I have my new setup, I've got the lighting just so, and I hope that you'll really enjoy what I have to offer. So. 
coming up the next few weeks, it's all gonna be about trunk hose. I already said in a previous newsletter that there's more lace making coming in 2024. I'm really looking forward to that. But for now, I wanna finish working on this suit. So um, thank you all, it's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, I'm happy to be able to talk with you and I look forward to showing you the first steps on making Giambattista Moroni's trunk hose from the tailor.